Effect One Two We're about to go live here in a little bit, baby. Let's go, let's go, let's go. Microphone check one two. Want to make sure everything sounds good and looks good. Hope everybody's doing well out there in YouTube land, wherever you guys are watching from. This is Josiah Igana with All Things Performance. And today we're going to be talking about perfectionism, right? Is perfectionism a good thing? Is it a bad thing? A lot of people, you know, when you start looking at this word perfectionism, they have different uh, definitions, different ideologies behind it. Some For some people, it's a badge of honor. Like, oh, man, she's such a perfectionist. Like, that man, that guy, he's perfect, man. He hits it every time, right? Or some people, it actually handcuffs, you know, their performance. And so today what we're going to do is we're going to look at the science uh, behind perfectionism. I'm going to tell you the saddest story ever uh, about perfectionism. And I'm also going to share with you some solutions that you can take away uh, that will help you in your career. Uh, I serve athletes and coaches. That is my POV. Um, and, you know, before I begin, one of the things that I would say I got my TD Jake's towel, you know what I'm saying? Got to, you know, got to keep it, got to keep it smooth under these bright lights, you know what I'm saying? Um, but one of the things that I will say is that I'm big on definitions. Those of you who know me, who have worked with me before, you know that I'm big on definitions. If you have 15 different people saying 15 different things or defining one concept 15 different ways, what happens is you create chaos. You create chaos. And so when you start looking at perfectionism, it is a state where one regards anything short of perfection as unacceptable, right? It's a state whereby one regards anything short of perfection as unacceptable. And you and I both know that that can be very dangerous, right? We've had athletes who have thrown away weeks, months, years, sometimes decades worth of training, competition, because they fell short in one area of their life. They fell short in one big game. They fell short in one huge competition because they weren't perfect, right? And so well, today we're gonna be talking about that. So when you start looking at, let's look at the science, right? When you look at some of the seminal history behind perfectionism, what they found was that people who had elevated levels of anxiety and depression were also diagnosed as having elevated levels of perfectionism. So it's actually rooted in clinical psychology. And it's interesting how that word has evolved through time into this world of athletics, which we are partaking in to mean so many different things, right? And so when you start looking at perfectionists, what are some characteristics of perfectionists? Number one, perfectionists, they love keeping their world small, right? They love keeping their world small. I can handle these two things, but if you give me 20 things, I'm going to lose my mind, right? I can go and play in the, at the local neighborhood park you know, or for the city league, but don't, I, don't, don't ask me to play in the, in, in the state finals or in the nationals, you know what I'm saying? Or the, at the Olympics, because they're really good over there, right? Perfectionists love keeping their world smart. They're, they're also uh, streak performers, right? When it's, when they're hot, they're hot, but when they suck, they suck. You know what I'm saying? And they and they get caught up, and we're going to talk about this here in a little bit. They get caught up equating their self esteem, their self worth, with their actual uh, performance. When you look at perfectionists, they're crushed by criticism. They're absolutely crushed by criticism in an, a very unhealthy way. As a high level performer, you have to have thick skin. As a professional athlete watching this, as a collegiate athlete watching this, you have to have thick skin. It is the very nature of our calling. It is the very nature of our profession. Not everyone can do what you do. That's why you represent a fraction of a fraction of a percentage of people who can actually do what you do. But if you are a perfectionist, if you are an unhealthy perfectionist, and we're not gonna be able to talk about all the different things today because we're only here for about 20 minutes, 30 minutes, but if you are an unhealthy perfectionist, this stuff eats you alive. There are a lot of firstborns. If you look at the, the uh, research by Dr. Kevin Lehman and others, there are a lot of firstborns who tend to be perfectionists. And one of the reasons, you know, one of the reasons why firstborns are like that, in my opinion, right? Raise your hand, firstborns. If you're a firstborn out there, raise your hand. One of the reasons why in my opinion, is because the firstborns innately have more time spent with mommy and daddy, right? They have more time with grandma, grandpa, aunties, uncles, and the community in which they were born into. And in their minds, they don't want to fail their caretakers. They don't want to fail their parents. And so they have this lofty expectation in their mind of what everyone thinks they should be doing. And so we see that a lot with, uh, with firstborns. Uh, perfectionists, they also see the flaws in everybody and everything, right? Man, why are you wearing that black belt with those brown shoes, man? 
You know what I'm saying? Hey, uh, that picture, that picture is two centimeters off. You, you might want to, you know what I'm saying? Perfectionists, they see flaws in everybody and everything, and they're going to let you know about it as well, right? They're going to absolutely let you know about it. And it becomes debilitating. It becomes frustrating, not only for them, but the, those, their teammates, coaches, and people who are around them. When you start looking at um, perfect, perfectionists, one of the things that I think is very sad is that they are blind. They become blind, uh, you know, metaphorically speaking, to the progress that they have made, right? I've done all this in my career. I came from nothing. I was a, uh, you know, unsigned free agent, undrafted free agent. No one thought I was going to do anything. I was bagging groceries. Now I'm on the, on the world stage in the NFL with tens of millions, hundreds of millions of people watching me all over the world. Perfectionists become blind to the progress they've made because that one performance, that one stretch, that one series, that one playoff run fell short. Very dangerous. It's a very dangerous place. You know, when you start looking at the Mona Lisa, right? The Mona Lisa, if you go and do some research on the Mona Lisa, the Mona Lisa is valued at over $860 million. And that value just keeps increasing with time. If you look at, if you look at uh, the Last Supper, which you've likely seen in your Bible, you know, or a, a church or any documentary, you've seen these depictions, right, of Jesus sitting with his disciples, the Last Supper, that painting is valued at over $450 million. There's another painting. If you um, look at your chiropractor's office or a, a, a medical office, you've seen this picture. I believe it's called, I think it's pronounced the Vitruvian Man, right? Correct me if I'm wrong on that, YouTube. I think it's the Vitruvian Man. And it's this guy, you know, long hair or whatever, you know what I'm saying? His hands are out here, transposed here, right? And that painting is insured, insured at over $1 billion, with a B. What the heck does this have to do with me as an athlete? What does this have to do with me as a, as a high-level performer? I'm going to tell you here in a second. All of those paintings were painted by an individual who is probably the saddest case of perfectionism that I have come across in my studies, and that is Leonardo da Vinci. Leonardo da Vinci was the epitome of a Renaissance man. right? We hear it all the time, all oh, the science and the art, the art and the science. right? We hear it all the time. You know, these terms used, you know, together colloquially. And Leonardo da Vinci literally was that guy. He was that guy. You know, yeah, they say, yeah, oh, I'm him. Oh, that's him. He's him. That's him. You know what I'm saying? Leonardo da Vinci was an inventor. He was a scholar. He was a sculptor. He was a painter. He, he was an innovator, right? And sadly, in his final days on his deathbed, as the legend goes, He's famously quoted as saying, I have failed both God and mankind because my work did not reach the quality it should have. That's deep, man. That's deep. You want to talk about somebody who was before his time intellectually. He was an artisan. You want to talk about the creme de la creme, the best of the best. I have failed both God and mankind because my work did not reach the quality that it should have. He didn't know that one day we'd be sitting here talking about his paintings that are worth, you know what I'm saying, billion, little, literally billions of dollars. You can go and buy a sports franchise with the type of money his stuff is worth today. You know the helicopter that we see in the, in, in the air as that fly? Leonardo da Vinci actually developed the predecessor of the modern day helicopter. It's called the corkscrew. The guy was brilliant. I have failed both man, I have failed, rather I have failed, I have failed both God and mankind rather, because my work did not reach the quality that it should have. And many perfectionists feel like this. I have failed everybody. I don't even know why I'm here. I don't even know why they signed me. I don't even know why they drafted me. I shouldn't even be here because the quality of my work, the quality of my game has deteriorated. It's fallen short. It's not good anymore, right? I know I'm speaking to somebody out there. And if you, if you look at perfectionists, right? Many perfectionists, they, they, they struggle and they're afraid of a couple of things. I'm gonna share with those, you know, I'm gonna share with you what those are, right? They're afraid. This type of behavior is actually rooted in fear. If you look at perfectionists, they have this fear of negative evaluation from others. 
That's number one. They have this fear of a negative evaluation of others. What are they going to think? What are they going to say? What are they going to write about me? Man, we live in, a, uh, we live in a, an online live world. You know what I'm saying? People have cameras. Man, you got athletes streaming from the clubhouse, streaming from the locker room. Like you can't even go, you can't even go into the locker room without somebody videotaping you, man. It's crazy. This negative evaluation of others drives some of this behavior, right? When you start looking at the fear of making mistakes is another one. Fear of making mistakes. I can't mess up. You know what I'm saying? There's a bit, again, there's this discrepancy, right? This is another, this area, you know, um, that people are afraid of. There's a uh, perfectionist are afraid of. There's this discrepancy in performance. I thought this was going to happen during the game, but only this happened, right? I thought my wide receivers were going to catch everything and they only caught five balls, man. I threw three picks. I thought I was going to go 18 for 18 from the line. You know what I'm saying? I only hit 10 of them. There's this discrepancy in performance that absolutely eats up perfectionists. I thought this was going to happen, but only this happened. It's crazy when you start thinking about it. But all this behavior, all of these fears are rooted in three major lies. The first lie is people will think less of me if I make mistakes. False. I'm here to say false. By very definition, as a professional athlete watching this right now, by very definition, people actually think more of you <laughs> because you represent a such a an, an elite number of people that by definition, they actually think more of you. This perfectionism lie that people think less. It's a, it's a lie. It's false. There's a, there's an old quote that I love and I know I'm going to butcher it, but it's, it's like, man, you know, you know, anybody who's pulling you down by definition, has already shown that you are above them. Because I can't pull you down if I'm above you. So when people pull you down and people in your mind are thinking that they're, le that you're, you're thinking that people are thinking less of you by pulling you down, it's actually not true. It's, Im it's impossible by definition. The other lie that perfectionism tells, or perfectionists tell themselves is that I have to do well at all times for people to respect me. I got to nail this interview. I got to walk a certain way. I got to dress a certain way. My wife has to drive a certain car, right? We have to live in a certain neighbor neighborhood so we can show that we are good. We're perfect. Man, please. That's a lie. That's a lie, man. And then lastly, I want to obliterate that definition that I sh share with you in the very outset is that if it's not perfect, it's not good enough. That's the big lie. If it's not perfect, it's not good enough. False. Perfection, we can hit every now and then, but we can hit excellence every single day, right? I like those chances. I like those numbers. You know what I'm saying? How many perfect games have there ever been in the, in the sport of baseball, right? How many perfect seasons has there ever been in the sport of football? You can just go... Example after example, sport after sport, perfection, you hit every now and then. Excellence, you can hit it every single day by the way that you show up, by the way that you respond, by the way that you treat people, by the words that you use, by the mindset that you have, right? You can be excellent every day, baby. You know what I'm saying? And so as we get into uh, the last part of this, I want to share with you some things that you can do to help you with, uh, with perfectionism, okay? And again, there, this I teach on this topic in conferences and seminars and, and you know workshops and stuff like this for hours. And what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to action pack, condense it into about 30 minutes. When you start looking at when you start looking at perfectionists, right, and perfectionism, I'm going to share with you some solutions here in a second. But before I do that, I want to share with you a story. Back in the day, even they even do it now, right? It's not so much now because our world is a little bit more stable than it used to be when people and nations were conquering other people and other nations, right? But one of the military tactics of old was that before one nation would besiege another nation, that nation would send respective spies, right? They would send spies to go and set up shop, to set up camps, 
to evaluate the comings and the goings, the, the routines, right? Uh, targets of interest, areas of weakness, areas of strength. They would go and send these spies. These spies would set up camps. And what they would do is they would evaluate and they would collect data. They would harvest data for days, weeks, months, sometimes even years before they would make an attack. And after they would get all this information, they would take down their camps and they would go back to headquarters, go back to their home country and say, hey, listen, guys, this is what we got to do. We can't go through the north side because they have this going on. We're, it, we're best to attack at dawn because of this. This is their target of interest. And if we can get here at this time, we have a chance. That's what they would do, right? And so the acronym that I want to share with you is CAMPS, C-A-M-P-S. And before you go into this next stage, right, of the year, this next stage in your season, this next chapter of wherever you are now, after listening to this discourse about perfectionism, I want you to set up camps. The first C, this is how you obliterate perf unhealthy perfectionism. The, the first letter is C, it stands for celebrate. Many perfectionists do not celebrate. They don't celebrate their wins. They don't celebrate you know, uh, the good that has happened, that has transpired during the course of their career, during the course of their season. They don't. It's like, you know, Bill Belichick, on to Cincinnati, on to Cincinnati. Next, we're just worried about the Man, you need to stop and you need to celebrate. If you're a wide receiver and you've gone an entire month or two without any drops, you need to go celebrate. If you're a basketball player and you're shooting 95% from the free throw line when you used to shoot 65% from the free throw line, go and celebrate. Why? Why do you need to celebrate? Well, I'm going to tell you why right now. The human brain releases dopamine at the expectancy of rewards. What does that mean? If I'm walking down the street, right, I'm walking down the street and I see a $20 bill or what looks like a $20 bill, and I get closer, I'm like, is it a 20? Is that a 20? And I pick it up. I'm like, yo, it's a $20 bill. You know what happens? Dopamine is released. If I'm expecting a very important text message from a very important somebody and I get that text message and I'm like, oh yeah, great news, right? What happens? Dopamine is released. If I'm practicing and we're practicing hard, you know what I'm saying? If we're hoopers and we're practicing hard and all of a sudden the athletic trainers start coming out and they start making that Gatorade with that ice, y'all know the sound. And they're making that, that your, your favorite flavor of Gatorade. And then we get to drink it. As soon as they're done, hey, guys, get, hey, the gate is ready. Let's go. What happens? Dopamine is released. When you celebrate, dopamine is released. And what happens is you want to repeat that experience again and again and again and again. This is why there are certain players, your Tom Brady's, uh, I guess he just retired today. Congratulations, Tom, on your retirement. Um, you know, I'm a Pittsburgh Steelers fan. Go Steelers, black and yellow. You know what I'm saying? The, he robbed many people of many things, but congratulations on your retirement. You got people like Tom Brady, people like uh, Kobe, Michael, Serena, Michael Phelps, right? And when I said Michael, y'all know who I'm talking about, MJ. The, these are what I call pathological winners. It's like in their DNA. It's, in, it's literally in their DNA. They have achieved such great levels of success and accomplishment within sport that they understand there is a certain feeling, right? We're talking about dopamine, right? There's a certain feeling that happens that they want to experience over and over and over again. One of uh, my colleagues back in the day, he told me something I'll never forget. He said, Josiah, you know what the most powerful drug is? And so I started naming off drugs, right? Uh, yeah. Uh, he's like, nope, 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 nope. I'm like, all right, man, I ain't playing this game anymore. He said the most powerful drug is an Olympic gold medal. Hmm. I said, okay. He said, man, the crash that you experienced, the crash that, and he was an Olympic performance coach. He, he does what I do. He just, he works with Olympians. He said, he said, the biggest crash comes about two to four weeks after an athlete wins a gold medal. There's no more coverage. There's no more Wheaties boxes. There's nobody singing your praises, singing your name. Right. Everybody forgets about who you are. He says the most powerful drug in sports. I'm like, dang. I'm like, wow. But beside the point, you have to celebrate. You have to become a pathological winner. The A, the A stands for go all out. You have to go all out. You have to if you only have a hundred, if you only have 80 percent that day, give 100 percent of your 80. If you're feeling 50 percent, man, I got this hammy going on. I got these tight quads. Give 100 percent of your 50. Right. 
I always say, I always tell this to athletes, you never know if you never go. What, ha what happens when you go all out is that you actually give yourself a true measuring stick of who you really are. You know what I'm saying? You, 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 you basically say, yo, this is my, my potential. Because I'm going all out, it becomes more clear. But you know what a lot of perfectionists do? A lot of unhealthy perfectionists? They don't go all out. So if my measuring stick, if my ruler, right, becomes more clear with time and me going all out gives me a clear sense of where I am on my potential, the inverse of that is true as well. If you are a perfectionist and you're not going all out because you don't want to mess up, you never know who you are. You're lying to yourself. That's what you're doing. And you're just wasting time. You never know if you never go. Again, we're talking about how to obliterate, how to obliterate unhealthy perfectionism. The first letter is C, celebrate. The next letter is A, go all out. The M, the M stands for make minor improvements. I ask athletes all the time, hey man, you better than you were last year? Oh yeah, man, I'm better than I was last year. You better than you were two years ago? Oh man, I'm way better than I was two years ago. Okay, how? Well, uh, uh, and then they kind of like, you know, they, it, it's kind of like this jump start, you know, and they start naming off all this stuff that they do. And I'm like, yo, listen, man, Peter Drucker said it the best, right? The business mogul, Peter Drucker. And although this is true of many things, it's not true of everything. He said, you cannot manage what you cannot measure. Okay. He said, you cannot manage what you cannot measure. So make minor improvements and then document it. Hey, man, you know what? I ran the mile in this amount of time. I ran the 40 in this amount of time. I lifted weights. And then after I lifted weights and after I did my cardio program, after six to eight weeks, when they tested me again, I did this. I actually got better, right? I used to do this when I was in the batter's box and my, 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 my average and my, and my sluggo, my, my, you know, all, all my, my metrics, whatever, whether I'm in the pitching mound, whether I'm a catcher, whatever the case may be, this is what I used to do. But after I started doing X, Y, and Z, blah, 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 like this is what happened. You make minor improvements and then you document it. Because when you make minor improvements and you document it, you know what you can do now? You can measure it. You can measure it. A lot of people say, oh, well, how, can you man how can you manage the brain? Or how can you measure what's going on in somebody's heart? And how can you measure? Dude, what you do is you take it from here, you take it from here, and then you put it here. That's how you do it. You know what I'm saying? So you make minor improvements. The P. The P stands for process. One of the most overused terms in the world of sports. Oh, process, process. We got to follow the process. Oh, my process, process. What the heck, man? What is process? One of the things that I will tell you before I give you a definition of process, my definition, my interpretation of process is this. There is not one person in the history of mankind who has ever taken a seed, an apple seed, let's call it, put it in the ground, and all of a sudden, an apple tree blossomed the next day. Doesn't exist, cannot exist, cannot happen. It, it violates every natural and biological law that there is. Right? Process, things take time. What is, what is the process? Process is inputs plus application plus evaluation over time. That's what the process is. If I'm creating a strength conditioning protocol for an athlete, what are the inputs? The inputs are, are squat, bench, uh, you know, uh, we're, we're going to do uh, power clean. We're going to do RDLs. We're going to do split leg lunges. We're going to do Romanian deadlifts. Whatever, the, whatever your inputs are, those are the inputs, right? And then we, there's application. Now we're actually going to do it. Three sets of eight with a you know a concentric of this and, a, and an eccentric of that. We're gonna do five sets of five. We're gonna do you know two sets of twelve on this corrective. Whatever the case may be. Now we're actually applying ourselves to these inputs. And then what do you do? You evaluate it. You evaluate it over a course of time. And guess what happens? You figure out real quick. Does my process work or does it not work? Do you know that Coca-Cola has a recipe for their original product that is in a vault that is worth a lot of money? I'm not even going to tell you how much it's worth. I want you to go and Google it. Go look it up. They have a recipe. I don't care how unhealthy it is. I really don't. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to drive a point home. They have a recipe that is proven and people like it. 
People like it. Coca-Cola has wiped the floor with their competition. Why? Because they have a process. They have a recipe that is it's foolproof. It's fail-proof. It works every single time. You need to have one as well. You have to have a process. Process are inputs plus application plus evaluation over time. Here are my inputs, boom, 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 my ingredients. Here's my application. I preheat the oven to this, I stir it for this much, I let it marinate for this much, I'm applying myself, right? Then I evaluate it, is it ready? Have I done everything that it called for me to do? Over the course of five days, five weeks, five months, whatever, I evaluate it, what worked well? What did, I, what did I do well? What can I do better? And I look it over the course of time and all of a sudden I start to have a process. The last ed letter, as we get ready to close, talking about obliterating perfectionism. The last letter is S, separate. You must separate who you are from what it is that you do. Not one of you athletes listening to me today would ever go and play in a high level, high leverage competition, right? Finish that competition, go to the locker room with all of your, your pads on, your, your, your gear, your jersey, you grab something to eat from the, from the food room, go home in the same clothes, right? Jump in the car in the same clothes. Have the, as Stephen A. Smith would say, the audacity, the temerity, the unmitigated gall to jump into your bed with those same clothes, the same mindset, the same clothes into your bed and go to sleep and then wake up eight hours later. You know what I'm saying? Brush your teeth, get something to eat, grab a coffee and then return to work in the same clothes and try to do it again. Not one of you listening to this would ever do that. Not one. But you know what's interesting? Oh, the mind is the most powerful thing, but we never train it. We do the same thing mentally. Many of you listening to this are doing the same thing mentally. You're not taking it off. You're not washing it. You're not evaluating it. You're not putting it off to the side and renewing your mind and renewing your body. You're not doing that. You're wearing the same thing, proverbially speaking, on your mind. And it's destroying performance. Many perfectionists equate, many unhealthy perfectionists equate what they do with who they are. I played a great game. That must mean I'm a great person. No, it doesn't. I played a terrible game. That must mean I'm a terrible person. No, it doesn't. Couldn't be further from the truth. You need to separate, S, separate who you are from what it is that you do. Again, I teach on this stuff for hours on end, and I hope that something from this small time that we had with each other, you know, uh, makes sense um, and that. It blesses you. And I just want to tell each and every one of you listening to this today that you don't have to be perfect. You, you should strive to be great. You should strive to be per perfect. But the maladaptive things that happen, the bad things that happen, <laughs> right, should not destroy you. It should not destroy your purpose. You were created to do something that only you can do on this earth. We're going to be coming to you guys weekly with these lives for uh for the, the the next foreseeable future with different topics make sure you stay tuned follow if you like this like subscribe share um i want to get this to as many people as possible and for those who want to take a deeper dive in terms of group coaching and some one-on-one -on -one stuff there are going to be application processes that you know we'll make sure that everybody gets to in due time but other than that god bless you god bless you hope that what i said today uh makes sense and that you can take something uh, from our talk today on perfectionism and really uh, absolutely uh, apply it to your life uh, and into your